good morning, everybody. If we haven't met, my name is Taylor. I am the production arts pastor here at the church. And uh, normally, they let me out of my hole in the back about once a year to come up here. But uh, we're doing back-to-back weeks, so this is fun. It'll be a, it'll be a, a good little ride. Um, you can open, if you have a Bible with you, open to, to Luke 19. That's where, where we will be this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you, that is okay. We will have the text up on the screen. Um, but we are going to be continuing in our series that we started last week, uh, Faces of Loneliness, with part two, Seen by Jesus. Uh, last week, we started, Pastor Cami and I, this series looking at the epidemic of loneliness and... Uh, wrestling out how do we as a church meet this issue both in our community and outside of our walls. Last fall, we went through a discernment season as a church, if you weren't able to participate, where we sought the Lord and asked him what area he of hurt in our community wanted us to address this coming year as a church, and he highlighted this issue of loneliness. And so we're taking a look at the issue to see how we can best meet it. We know a few things though, if we're going to reach out into the world to touch this area of pain with the love of God, we need to first experience that healing touch ourselves. We can't lead people where we aren't able to go ourselves. And so the series is focused on our ability to live in community, not only with God, but with each other, so that we can better minister to the lonely beyond our walls. We also believe that scripture contains wisdom for how we live our lives. And so we are taking the time to take a look at scripture and see what examples it has for us in how we live out what we're calling true biblical community. Last week we took a look at the layers of community that, community that research suggests that each person is capable of managing and we looked at how Jesus exemplified that uh, same sort of structure with his disciples and his inner circle and his greater crowds that followed him. And we also looked at how in those relationships he exemplified one of our aspects of true biblical community in that they were close. And put simply, that is just physically and emotionally present with those we're experiencing daily life with. So this week, we are taking a look at the story of Zacchaeus and seeing if there's any wisdom for true biblical community in the story of Zacchaeus that we can pull out. Pastor Mike Full always said that a text without a context is a pretext. And I've been using that quote in messages a lot over the years, so I was kind of wondering how many times I need to say it before I can start taking credit for it myself, and, oh. It looks like I hit my mark, so I get, as I always say, a text without a (sighs) Now they have the power, they get to mute me instead of me muting Cammie. Well, I've got a couple more in here, so we'll see how it goes. So we're gonna be taking a look though at the literary context of this passage and seeing what it is that Luke wants to communicate to us through the ways that he's arranged the narrative. See, Luke is, as any of the biblical authors are, brilliant, brilliant writers. And they have intentionally, Luke has intentionally selected and arranged particular stories from the life of Jesus to communicate certain truths. So we're gonna take a look back at some of the stories that lead up to the story of Zacchaeus and see if Luke creates any categories for us that we need to be paying attention to. We see in Luke 18, verses nine through 14, uh, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee there comes to, to pray and says, thank you, God, that I'm not like other men, that I read my Bible, that I fast twice a week, that I make sure that I'm giving my tithe every month, that I'm doing all the right things. I'm going through the right motions. Thank you, God, that I have it all together. And then 
a tax collector shows up. And as we talked about last week, tax collectors are enemies of the Jewish people because they're traitors. And a tax collector shows up in the parable and he says, have mercy on me, God, a sinner. And he acknowledges his guilt before God for the wrongs that he's committed. Jesus goes on in Luke 18, 15 to 17, saying to let the children come to him because anyone who does not receive the kingdom of heaven in a childlike manner will not enter it. In uh, Luke 18, 18 to 30, we have the story of the rich young ruler where a wealthy young man comes and asks to follow Jesus and they have some dialogue. And so we have categories of a rich ruler and Jesus asks him to distribute his wealth to the poor. Then after this, his disciples, after the man leaves dejected, his disciples come and ask, Jesus, who then can be saved? Jesus says with God, it's possible. And then in 1835 to 43, we see Jesus heal a blind beggar and he tells him that it's his faith that has made him well. That leads us right up to our story of Zacchaeus here in Luke 19, where it says, he entered Jericho, that's Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And Jesus here is on his final trip towards Jerusalem for what would be his triumphal entry. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham, for the son of man, uh, which is kind of an idiomatic phrase that Jesus used to refer to himself by, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, does Zacchaeus check any of the boxes that Luke has just laid out for us? Well, We see pretty quickly that he is a chief tax collector. In other words, he is a ruler. He's a man of authority. And that he's rich. Luke didn't have to tell us explicitly that he was rich. As the chief tax collector in a major trade center like Jericho, we could assume that he had the opportunity to amass significant wealth, but he goes out of his way to highlight that he was rich. Zacchaeus is also described as short in stature, He runs ahead, which would have been something completely undignified for an adult man to do. To run at all would have been beneath his station as an adult and as a man. And he even goes so far as to climb a tree. His name, Zacchaeus, is a Greek transliteration of a Hebrew name that was common at the time, Zacchae, which uh, means pure or innocent. Somewhat ironic for the life that he had led, but I think incredibly important for the way that Jesus saw him. Despite the sin, despite the hurt, Jesus knew what he was about to do on the cross and in his resurrection, and he said, I see you pure and innocent. All of these descriptors come together to paint Zacchaeus in childlike terms as he's presented before Jesus. In other words, he came to Jesus as a child. The crowd then grumbles and calls Zacchaeus a sinner. Zacchaeus responds to the call of Jesus by distributing his wealth to the poor and he acknowledges his sin before God. 
And Zacchaeus' restitution of wealth, the f- I restore four times to anyone I've defrauded, goes beyond even the Mosaic Law's requirement for normal monetary theft, but is in more in line with uh, theft of a livestock that is then killed or sold. Anything that is irredeemable or inre- irrestorable would have been four times. And he even goes as far as to not only restore the wrong that he's done, but give away to the poor the other half. Zacchaeus and his house, we're told, received salvation for his act of faith. And make no mistake, he does not receive salvation for giving his money away, but because he responded in faith and joy to the loving call of Jesus. So we have a pretty robust list. Can we, Josh, rearrange these to see if they line up? And there we see on both sides of the columns, sinner acknowledges guilt, childlike, rich, ruler, distributes wealth, saved, and faith. Why would Luke do this? Well, I believe that Luke wants us to see Zacchaeus as an archetype for the type of person who enters into the community of Jesus' followers. He does so by seeking Jesus' faith and responding to his call. And so do we today. When we pick up the story, we know that Zacchaeus is a lonely person. William Barclay in his commentary on this text says Zacchaeus was wealthy, but he was not happy. Inevitably, he was lonely, for he had chosen a way that made him an outcast. He was a tax collector, remember, an enemy and a traitor to the Jewish people, and yet he was not a Roman, and so the people that he worked with also would have looked down on him as a conquered and subjugated people. So how do he and Jesus encounter one another? The first characteristic of true biblical community that we're going to look at today is that they go deep. And what we mean by that is that uh, we, they uncover the desires of each other's heart and fight alongside one another for a common goal. Picture a shovel digging through the difficulties and the muck and the mire to get to what is hidden underneath. Zacchaeus quickly begins participating in the mission of Jesus to uh, bring restorative justice by giving away his wealth and alleviate human suffering through the means that he has. And as followers of Jesus, we automatically have a built-in common goal. We get to love each other and love God in a way that becomes attractive to the outside world in desperate need of a healing touch from him. We get to, despite our differences, despite the different ways that we approach issues, be united in this one most important issue, that we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that through him, all things will be made new. So why don't we do this? Why don't we go deep with each other? Well, a quick history lesson. At the Industrial Revolution, Our worlds were fragmented into our home, work, and spiritual lives. And as a result, we continue to live lives that are siloed into those three areas. Any effort to carve out time to either bridge those or to go deeper with people feels like it's contributing to our already overfull schedules, and so we reject it outright. And as a result, we isolate even further. It's also messy, and it takes time to do this, to go deep? What if we don't agree with someone? Remember last week we talked about valuing the different opinions. And if I'm honest, I disagree with a lot of my close friends on some pretty key issues. For example, a lot of my friends think that chocolate chip cookies are the best cookies. And I know that they're wrong and that oatmeal raisin cookies are the best cookies. But we continue to have community and fellowship despite that huge, huge chasm between us. (laughs) If you're a chocolate chip cookie person, don't at me. (laughs) 
Why? So why should we do it if it's difficult? If we have to get through all the dirt, why should we do it? Well, if we learned anything from the gold rush, you have to sift through dirt to find gold. We cannot accomplish anything of eternal worth without partnering with each other in the mission to bring the kingdom of heaven here to earth, to the United States, to California, to RSM. Without each other and without Jesus, we can do nothing. Paul says in Romans 12, just as our bodies have have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. We often think that friendship is about us and what we can get from another person, but the most satisfying and bonding types of relationships arise when friendship and community are centered on a bigger mission. Zacchaeus joined the community of Jesus followers by participating in their shared mission, and so how do we carve out time to do this with each other? The first thing I would suggest is set aside time to be undistracted with people. Think through an area of your life that you are excited about and that you want to share with someone and bring them into it. In these times that we set aside, Leave your phone off, leave it in the car, put it on do not disturb. One of the things that I admire about my little brother is that whenever I text him, I get the little notice that his phone has notifications silent. He makes a regular practice of being undistracted with the people that he's around. I would like, if we can, guys, scrub that part from the recording. I don't want him to know that I admire anything about him. Thank you. The other thing we can do is learn to be curious and ask others questions. This is an area that I will admit is a weak spot for me. I am often talking with my wife about a conversation that I had and she'll begin to ask me questions and I'll go, well, I don't know, I didn't ask that. And she'll be like, why? Why would you not ask that question? Uh, didn't think of it. I have not learned to be curious well when it comes to other people. It's a skill that I own that I need to grow in and I would guess that I'm not alone in this room. We live such isolated lives so often that it's a difficult skill for us to develop without added practice. And so put in the time, look up questions, learn to be curious. What if I don't have the time, I would challenge you to check your time inventory. A lot of us waste a lot of time. And then we feel busy because we just wasted so much time. Maybe you are genuinely very busy and you're not wasting any time. If that's the case, I would still suggest inviting someone else into your busyness. There are a few things that we all have to do. Maybe it's cooking and eating a meal. Do that with another family. And I don't mean have a potluck with another family. I mean go over and cook together and then sit down and eat together. Maybe you're someone who likes to read books. You don't have to start a whole book club. Just read the same book as someone else and talk about it. In person is better, but if you don't have time for that, over the phone, over text as you go throughout your day, but find something that you can share, a small step, and come together around a shared goal. If you are able to work remotely, Find another person who works remotely, go to a coffee shop, and work just next to each other. It may not be the ultimate goal of deep relationship, but it is a step in the right direction. The other thing that I hear a lot of people talk about is kids. What about uh, my kids, or I am married without kids, or single, and my friends that are married or have kids don't have time because they're always with their families. I would argue you should include the kids. Make them a part of it. And if you don't like kids, I get it. I don't like kids. 
But what I've found is that kids that become like family to me when they're included in my community, a little soft spot in my heart starts to form. This is true with uh, like Pastor Leah's boys. For whatever reason, they've been around enough that a little soft spot has formed in my heart for them. <laughs> my, uh, my sister-in-law sent me a picture of a sonogram of their unborn baby. And I started to cry looking at the face of this child. I haven't even met this kid. But family does something. And so when we see each other as family, it does something. The other aspect of true biblical community that we see in our story of Zacchaeus is that they are transparent with one another. And that just means the ability and willingness to be seen, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Jesus is willing to stop and see Zacchaeus exposed and vulnerable up in a tree, and Jesus is willing to come down and bear his sin and his iniquity to Jesus. Imagine an open door into our souls that we allow those that we're closest to full access to, full right to open and peer through. And we don't often do this with people because it's painful or it feels unsafe. Maybe you have tried to do this before and you've been hurt. And so you bear the scars or even the fresh wounds of abused vulnerability in the past. Maybe you're not sure if a new group of friends is safe and you can trust them not to repeat those same uh, acts of violence against you. It is okay to take your time with this. In fact, I would not recommend meeting someone for the first time and bearing all of your sins to them. (laughs) Make sure that you are in a safe, loving space. Take the time, again, our best asset in developing this kind of community. Take the time to grow more and more open with that door to dig deeper and deeper with people. Maybe you don't uh, live a transparent or vulnerable life because it feels selfish to do. Other people have it worse than I do after all, and I I don't want to seem needy. That would hurt my pride. When I was a senior in high school, I had sunk into a deep, deep depression. And I reached out to uh, that winter to a few of my closest friends just to share kind of what I was going through and, and where I was at. And then two weeks later, my best friend's father committed suicide. It not only wrecked me because of the pain of that loss, but it wrecked me because for the coming months I blamed myself for his loss. I thought to myself, if I hadn't taken attention away, if I hadn't shared what I was going through, then his dad would have gotten the help that he needed and would still be here. And let me tell you, that is a lie straight from the mouth of the enemy. And yet, sometimes we believe those lies and we allow the lies of the enemy to keep us isolated and keep us apart and keep us ineffective because remember, we need each other to be effective. So why should we, despite the risk, open the door? We talked last week about needing to be fully known in order to be fully loved. And people can't love what they don't know about. I will often sign Uh, anniversary cards and birthday cards to my wife with the the words, all of you. And it's a little punny because it kind of sounds like I love you, but also that I love every part of you. Now it's easy with her because every part of her is perfect. (laughs) It's a little harder for her because she gets to love the perfect parts about me 
Uh, but there's also a couple slightly imperfect parts of me. <laughs> and she has to love those too. As we invite people into these things, we allow them to reflect the heart of God in walking with us through difficult times. Psalm 23, four says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. It is the way of Jesus to walk with us through difficulties and to see those things and see us through them. And so as we do that with each other, we continue to reflect the love and light of Jesus out to a world who needs to see it. Transparency also allows us to call each other onward and upward. Zacchaeus could not have participated in the mission of Jesus if he hadn't been willing to candidly own the parts of causing suffering that he had contributed to. If he hadn't owned the fact that he had defrauded people, he would not have been able to publicly step into the ministry of Jesus and restore those things to the people he had defrauded. We also, as we bear each other's burdens, bond with each other in deep and powerful ways. I'm going to change some names in the story just to uh, protect the people that are involved in it, and I thought it'd be fun because Pastor Josh always uses Marvel to illustrate things. I am going to use Star Wars. So imagine a group of friends living on Naboo, and we have Han Solo there, and of course, Leia Organa is there. A little deeper cut for some of you nerds, Kanan Jarrus and Harrison Dula are there. I know the timelines don't line up, so It's okay, it's just an illustration. (laughs) And uh, Han begins telling us this story about his cousin who a former good friend of his had physically and emotionally abused in a relationship. And how the actions of this friend had severed the once close bond of friendship And he begins to weep. This is Han Solo, mind you. Rugged, swashbuckling exterior. And he begins to weep in front of us. We grew so much closer that day. We truly became family that day as we were able to not judge his vulnerability and his weakness, but rally around him and encourage him to learn to feel and to process the grief in the safety of community. C.S. Lewis says, love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you wanna make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. It is not God's heart for us to have tough, stony, unbreakable hearts. He says that he will replace, in fact, our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. He has made you for intimate, vulnerable, transparent relationship with those closest to you. I would believe I would be remiss in not saying that not everyone gets this level of transparency. Remember, we have thresholds for how many people we can manage at each level of community. And so the people in your village, that 15 to 20 that we talked about last week, they get a certain level of transparency as they do life with you day by day. But the only people that get the fully open door are the people in that two to five close friends. 
as you learn to navigate this with people that you haven't been transparent with in the past, communication is key. It's important to establish boundaries about where you feel safe at this point in your journey together and communicate when you feel like those boundaries are being pushed or not being met in uh, ways that make you uncomfortable and then work together to move forward and open the door further and further over time. People also might not reciprocate your vulnerability. Again, communication is key and agreed upon expectations about where you're going with your relationship is important. But also remember with those layers of community that people have limited capacities for how many close friends they have. Someone once uh, compared friendships with me to a coat hanger or a, a coat rack and there's, there's hangers on the rack but the coat rack is only so big and there's only room for so many hangers on it. And if I have an empty coat rack but someone has next to me a full coat rack and I try to put my coat on their rack, there might not be room for it. That's okay. There's a lot of people in this room with space on their coat rack. Go find one and build true biblical community with those people. If we do this well, our church should develop branches that reach out into our city and bear the fruit of love that combats loneliness in powerful ways. This is the call that the Lord has put on this church for this year. We have an opportunity to step into it. Let's not miss it. I was talking to an ecologist friend of mine recently about what it takes for seeds to become fruit-bearing plants. And she gave me a longer list than this, but a couple things that stood out were that seeds uh, need to be in tilled soil. Crusted over soil, tough on the outside, needs to be broken for the soft underneath to be exposed. Seeds need to be planted deep enough to send out roots and ultimately become fruit-bearing plants. And true biblical community is no different. For us to bear fruit in this endeavor, we need the same level of transparency and depth that Jesus and Zacchaeus met each other with in Jericho 2,000 years ago. As the worship team comes out, we're gonna step into a time of response and worship, we know, invites the light of Jesus to break the darkness. It invites him to see us and allows us to see him in all of his glory. And it's from that posture that we are ready to respond when he calls us by name and says, I know you, I've known everything you have ever done, and I love you with a deep, deep love. Come, follow me. Maybe today you came into this room like Zacchaeus, just curious to get a peek of Jesus. Maybe he is calling you by name right now. I believe it is his heart to do so. And if he is, the question then before you is will you come down from the tree and receive him joyfully? Will you come join the mission of the kingdom of heaven to bring abundant life to the world. If that's you this morning, I would just ask you to, under your breath, repeat a simple prayer after me. You don't have to say it out loud. I won't ask you to raise your hand or anything. But just pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I acknowledge that I have lived a life for myself and for my own gain, but today I see you. Today I choose to participate in your mission and bring your restorative touch to others. 
today I receive your salvation. If that's you this morning, if you said that prayer maybe for the first time, if you've been on the outside of community for a long time, I would encourage you to get connected. Head to the Welcome Center after service, join a bridge group, go out to lunch with somebody today. But first, I would invite you to stand and join together in one voice as we lift praise to the God who sees us.